Welcome to the Stellar Gaming Dev YouTube channel. Today I am going to show you how to make a character do a combo for a 2D game that has combat style fighting. I'll also show you how to connect a variable to text to make a hit counter so you can see how many hits are being performed. Before we get started, don't forget that if you find my videos useful, click that like button, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Let's jump right into it. These are the extensions I am using in this project. The resource bar extension. The repeat extension. The shake object extension. Platformer character animator. Gamepads extension. And the health and points damage extension. Let's head over to the main scene window and see what objects I have ready. There are four objects on the screen and I will be going over how this tutorial handles them. I have made folders for every object group I will be using so I won't get disorganized. The first folder is for the enemy health bar. The second folder is for the fireball projectile. It's not on the main scene right now, but I will be creating it later in the event sheet when the character does an attack. Here is a look at the properties for the particle I am using. The fire buster particle has the same properties but I will change them in the event sheet to make it bigger. The hitbox folder is where I will keep all the hitboxes that will be created at specific points. You can see that I have them named where I want them to appear. These are really simple to make and can be created in Piscal in a very short time. Each hitbox points for the origin and center are equal. The collision mask is on the default setting which covers the entire object automatically. The same is done for all other hitboxes. The characters folder has the characters I will be using. Fighter A, which I also call Red Blaze, has more animations than the last project which makes things easier to see for this tutorial. Robo is here for target and combo practice. The last folder is for the combo counter and is a regular text object. Let's move over to the event sheet so we can get started. I have some conditions and actions here set based on what I am going to show. The first, and in my opinion the easiest to do, is linking a variable and the text object so that when something is added to the variable it will be shown through the text object. To test this out, let's go to the first code block and you'll see there isn't any conditions, but there is an action which modifies the text through a global variable. The second block has a condition that works when the letter Q is pressed on the keyboard. This action will add one to the global variable every time the letter Q is pressed. Let's head over to the global variable window in the project settings to take a look. Here you can see the variable combo counter is set to number and the value is set to zero. Now if we go back to the first block and look at the action which modifies the text based on the variable we can see how it is set up. The text object is selected. The action is to change the text. The modification sign is set to equal and the value is set to global variable string with two round brackets and the name of the global variable inside of it. That's all is needed. Now to test and see if it works. When I press the letter Q on the keyboard, the text object should change. So I did press Q, 
but that's not what I wanted to happen. If you noticed earlier, I didn't have a trigger once while true in the second code block in the conditions, so if I pressed Q, the number would keep going until I released the key. It works fine now. If you're seeing the same thing, then you've just connected a text object to a global variable successfully. You no longer need the second code block and you can disable it by clicking on the entire block and pressing the D key, or if you want to, you can just delete the entire thing. Now it's time to move to the hitboxes for the red hero. Moving on to the character properties, I have a new set of animations, but let's go to the behaviors and you'll see the platform character animator, which easily animates your platform character. However, for this project, I am using it for the flippable property since it horizontally flips your character automatically. If I go to the character's points, you will see the center and origin are in the proper place. But there is another point called Punch A1. This is where I want the hitbox to be. And this would be the frame number I want it to appear at, which is frame number 20. So in the event sheet, I need to make sure the Punch A1 hitbox appears at this part of the animation only. We can move back to the event sheet and see the reference to each animation move. There's a section for the first punch and so forth. If we take a look at the first code block for punch, this particular condition checks to see if any of the subconditions under it are true. The first subcondition is if the A key is pressed and the second subcondition checks if the gamepad X button is pressed. This is where the gamepad's extension comes in handy. I added it to my project because I like to test on both the keyboard and gamepad when doing things like this. I feel game controllers are better for me to do button mashing on. When I press the appropriate button, the animation will change to whatever I want, in this case the punch animation. For the second code block, this condition monitors if the punch animation is currently active. The next condition checks if the current frame of the punch animation is equal to 20. The second block is set to trigger once while true. If all these conditions are met, the appropriate action to create the hitbox on this animation at the current frame number will occur. We can take a closer look and see how this is set up in the actions. The object I want to create is selected, which is the punch A1 hitbox and it will be created on the exact point I made in my character's properties earlier. After it is created, there is a 0.2 second wait action, and then the hitbox is deleted. This is done to match the speed of the animation, however, the wait time could be whatever you want, based on the moves you are doing, especially if you want the combo chaining to be easier. The final code block has a condition that checks to see if the punch animation has been performed, then the next condition checks if the animation is finished. This block is set to trigger once while true and the action is set to turn the animation back to the normal idle stance if it is finished. This setup is the same for all the moves in this event sheet. Now let's go see them appear when I press a button. I can use the game controller to move around a little. Then I can press a few buttons to see if the hitboxes appear. I'll do the punch first. Hey then I'll do the second punch. Let's try the first kick. Hey the hitbox appears at the right spot. How about the button for the second kick? Now that I have verified the hitboxes appear correctly. I can move down to this code block here which has a scene timer. This scene timer is used only to reset the global variable combo counter back to zero after a certain amount of time. With the time set to 0.8, that means you would need to press the next button quickly or it will reset the combo. This timer is started or reset as soon as the hitbox collides with the enemy's collision box. I'll move down here and show you where this happens. 
In the enemy group, I have a condition for when Robo collides with any of the hitboxes and they are all set to trigger once. They have pretty much the same actions except for the damage output. Here is where I use the shake extension, so every time Robo is hit, he will shake from the impact of that hit. I find these settings fine for me when it comes to lighter attacks that don't deal much damage. Here is where you would put the action to add one to the combo counter variable, which will then update the text object. Every successful collision will add one to the hit count. Here is where the scene timer is reset so that every time a hit is successful the combo timer won't run out. The rest of the actions are the sound effects and deal with health, which you can easily control. And as I mentioned earlier, everything is pretty much the same except for the damage output. Now we can go test and see how the combos work if I wait too long or if I press the button in time. This is what happens when I don't press the button fast enough. This is what happens when I do press the buttons fast enough. If I can press the buttons rapidly enough on the game controller before timer runs out, the number of hits increase. Since this is working how I want, we can now check out the section for the projectile. For a projectile using GDevelop's built-in particle engine, if it's just one hit you can simply do a collision with that projectile without a hitbox, and just add one to your global combo counter variable when it hits the target. This is only if you want the projectile to be able to be comboed off of. You then reset the timer like you would for the normal moves. You can see from this code block that it's just a simple collision with the action similar to the normal attacks. However, if it's a multi-hitting projectile such as Firebuster, I treat it differently. In theory, you could use the actual projectile colliding with the intended target to combo off of, but I found using a hitbox better in this case for a moving projectile, with the hit range and consistency being good. When doing multi-hitting moves with projectiles or really any magical ability, you might find the repeat every X seconds extension quite useful and convenient. It has several actions that involve a timer you will name. For this particular condition, the timer named Firebuster will repeat the actions for 5 times in 0.1 second intervals. So you can create a multi-hitting attack that is either moving or static for however long you want. All of the actions are the same except in this case I have an action to change the sprite color to red, then there is a split second pause before one hit is added to the global combo counter variable, and I change the color back white, which for sprite objects would be the normal color. You'll also see a new action here that resets the repetition count for the timer fire buster. This action is a part of the repeat every X seconds extension. You will need this so that it will reset the timer so you can perform it again. The last action is for the combo reset scene variable, and you already know how it works. The frame where I create the projectile is also the frame where I will create the hitbox. I then will add the same properties the projectile has to the hitbox. If the projectile is moving, then I will add a force to the hitbox with the same speed so they move together. For projectiles that are not created using GDevelop's particle simulator, you can use the sticker extension to attach your hitbox to it. This extension sticks objects to each other and can be quite useful for other things like character items and plenty of other stuff. Let's take a look at the projectiles in game. In the game you will see that the fireball projectile is still counted as a hit.
but it is obviously too slow to chain into a combo with the other smaller fireball projectiles. However, if you created a character whose walk or run speed was fast enough, they could outrun their own projectiles and add to the hits. Firebuster, on the other hand, is faster and does more hits. You can see it here with the hitbox visible. Firebuster is faster than both the regular fireball and the character, but since it is multi-hitting, a regular fireball could be released and if a firebuster is thrown after it, both hits would count in the combo. Similarly, if Firebuster is done in a chain of attacks, this would allow Red Hero to make it in time to add to the hits. And since Firebuster is multi-hitting and can be done at close range, it can be performed with the other normal moves if done fast enough. Of course, if Firebuster required energy to perform, it couldn't be spammed like this, which is a good thing. If you want to hide the hitboxes, all you need to do is use the hide an object action after you use the action to create the hitbox. You can do this for each hitbox you want to hide in your event sheet. When you are done, the next time you start your game, there will be no hitboxes for anyone to see. Looks like we are now hitbox free. Well, that concludes this tutorial on performing a simple combo. This was how I learned how to do it in the past. If you found this video insightful or it gave you some ideas for things to try, don't forget to like, subscribe, and even comment, and I'll do my best to respond. I'm working my way down my list and I will be redoing my older videos and making them easier to understand, and possibly adding project files to download. I am also aware of GDevelop now having an easy multiplayer setup, so the ideas are coming to my mind about some multiplayer games too, 